So, um, we're actually recording and going live and all that stuff. We're recording this, uh, Reetha is, and we'll be getting these out um, to have anybody who needs them. And, and listen, if you get something out of this, share it. If you hear God in any of this, share that. It, it, this is not about going through some religious exercise. Quit throwing snowballs, it's too early. <laughs> People are going to wonder about why that's on this recording in the middle of September. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for all kinds of presentation in any season. Father, thank you for this place that you let us live in. Thank you for our lives. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the peace that you give us that nobody can take from us. Thank you for this relationship that allows us to have a dialogue, a conversation with you on a regular basis, not just something that we do on Sundays. Father, thank you that you wanted it like this all along. And the Lord, give us hearts that are willing to hear what you have to say, to follow your leading, and to listen to and and abide by the instruction that you give us. Not someone else's interpretation of it, the instruction that you give us. Lord, you're very clear when you say things. Help us to understand and know that clarity even more so that we can live the victorious lives that you desired for us to live all along. In Jesus' name. You know, I, 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 nothing bothers me more than I, I've been sending out these invitations on, uh, on Facebook Messenger to join me in some Bible study devotionals that I'm working on. Uh, and I've, I've been through quite a bit. I, I didn't realize that I was looking through my last, last several months and I've been through like 17 of these plans as part of my regular daily devotional. And, and it's not that those things are necessary, but they give you a prompt. Most of you have prompts. There are telephones, cell phones, computers. You're used to working according to the prompts. So if you prompt yourself to spend more time with him by engaging in a devotional as a group, then the chances are you're going to be spending more time with him. And it's not a matter of how much time you spend with him. It's a matter of spending time with him. That's what he created us for. He created us so that we could have time relationship with him for eternity. That's what he wants. Okay. I sort of started preaching prematurely. That happens every once in a while. If you would go to Genesis chapter 22. We're, we're, I'm, I, I have officially started this devotional for tomorrow. And if you haven't gotten it already, let Tracy know or me know. I'll make sure you get a, a copy of that link so that you can join me. But it's, it's on faith. And, 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 I, and that has been just about as abused as any tenet of our relationship with God, as, as any aspect of doctrine that has ever been put out there. And, and it's unfortunate because faith is the key to that relationship with Him. So in Genesis 22, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 14, I'm, I, I use a variety of versions. This is one of the ones I like. It's uh, New Living. My, a lot of my study time is in New King James, just because that's what I learned to speak. Going to, I learned that or the American Standard or the Catholic or Revised. You, you know, I, I just picked one. There's like thousands of them out there, at least hundreds. And, and take the time to dig in and find a version that you're comfortable with. But find also one that is a studious, well-prepared version that you can go back to, that you know is, has the acid test. And, and all, of them, um, all of them are good. They, they all contain God's Word. So Genesis 22, beginning in the first verse. Now, let, let me set this up just a little bit. Up here, what's happened to this point for Abram, okay? Uh, Abram, before he's known as Abraham, Abram leaves Ur of the Chaldees with his, with his dad. He goes lives in a place called Haran. God speaks to him. He leaves again. And then God gives him a promise. He's sending him to a place he hasn't seen before. And, and this place, he's not gonna, he doesn't have any kids. 
So what happens when he can't till the ground or hunt the animals or do whatever has to be done? So he goes there. He just obeys God and he goes there. And then God promises him he's going to have a child. He's going to have a son. And so that happens over a period of time. He has a son. Listen, when God blesses you, do not miss this. Every blessing with that you receive from God is going to come with an attack from the enemy at some point. And God will use that attack to increase your faith if you will allow that. You see, Abraham could have gotten really self-satisfied. He could have gone, I got my boy. He can, work, he can work those mules. He can plant those crops. He can harvest those chickens. Whatever. But God wants him to go to a higher place because Abraham trusted God enough to go somewhere he was told to go without having any roadmaps, no AAA, nothing. He just went because God told him to do that. God will tell you to do things in your life and challenge you to go places in your life that you would not normally go. And sometimes, many times, He'll use that to increase your faith. Let's look at the test. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. Now you would expect at that point, if it were most of us, you'd be going, hey, wait a minute. You made me a promise, but you don't see that with Abraham. All right? This is what you see. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a bird offering and set off for the place God had told him about. You see, practice makes perfect. God told him to go one place before, and, and, and so he listened. So God, God starts that conversation the same way. I want you to go to this place that I'm going to show you. So, on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey. Abraham told the servants, the boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. All right, first of all, what did God just tell him to go do? He told him to go take his son and offer him as a burnt sacrifice on this mountain. What did Abraham say? The boy and I are going to go, we're going to worship, and we're coming back. He didn't say, I'm coming back. He said, we're coming back. That's really key. Pay attention to that. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son. Abraham replied, we have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? So this kid's probably 13-ish, about the time that a, a Jewish boy would be bar mitzvah today. All right. So, so here we have Abraham responding, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Key. Pay attention to that second key. Say it again. I'm sorry. All right. It's God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. It's verse number eight. And they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied up his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Okay, imagine a 13-year-old boy and a 113-year-old man. That boy was raised to respect his father. It didn't say Abraham had to struggle with the boy and tie him up. It said Abraham tied him up. One of the problems we have today in our society is the lack of respect that young people have for adults. And that adults should have for the young people in their charge. It's a two-way street. And Abraham 
picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. This is really tough. So, Leslie has to go out on top of the mountain, pick one, we got some, and, and he's got to offer Josiah. First of all, Josiah is not going to stand there and let his daddy tie him up. He's going to run like the Dickens to the next mountain and say, catch me if you can. I'm, I'm impressed with Isaac, okay? I'm impressed with Abraham. Abraham then picks up the knife. Do you remember those two things I told you, the key aspects? First, he sells, tells the servants, the boy and I are going to go up and we're going to worship. And then we're coming back, right back. And his son asks him on the way, Dad, I see the fire and the wood, but where's the sacrifice? God will provide the lamb. Now, yes, I understand the messianic implications of that, but we're talking about the first of the Hebrews walking with his son, getting ready to offer him as a burnt sacrifice. What is he thinking? He's not thinking about the coming Messiah. He's thinking about, you know, I've trusted, I've trusted this God enough that I'm, I've done everything He said because I believe He's going to bring this boy by my side back to his mama. Well, what happens? And then, at that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, yes, Abraham replied. Here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Don't hurt him in any way. For now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the, the place Yahweh Yira, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. However, most of them don't really believe it. Most of them don't believe that God will provide. Let me share something with you. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna. Um, the next place we're gonna be in scripture is First Samuel chapter one. But I want to share this with you. Okay, anyway, I'll go here. All right. I, I want to talk a little bit about worry and fear. You see, the message today is about faith, but faith has an opposite, and that opposite is fear. Fear and worry and any other label you want to put on it will keep you from God's best. Only by faith and patience do we inherit the promises of God. Few behaviors like worry and fear, and then using our mouth to bring life to that worry and fear, few behaviors sabotage our, effects, our effectiveness more than worry and fear. But this pandemic is treatable. After all, worry is internal. No one forces you to do it. I've talked to people, well, I just have to worry about this, and I just have to worry about that. Who said? Who told you? Huh? Using our mouth to we give when we when we take our worries and our fears yeah. and we and we then give life to those worries and fears, uh -huh. we have become our own worst enemy. People yeah. do it all the time. Okay. I'm just never gonna get another job. I'm just never gonna get okay. But what did Abraham say on the way up the mountain? Boy and I are coming back. The Lord himself will provide the lamb. What happened? The Lord provided the lamb. Amen. You know, if you fast forward into the New Testament, 
That translates. If you ask believing to receive, you'll have whatever you say. Whatever you say. You ask from the Lord believing to receive, you'll have whatever you say. Okay, we've got centuries of theologians trying to put restrictions on God over that. It's not true. In fact, you know, if I, if I just pick one, let me pick, a, let me pick a scripture here out of Mark. Don't worry about it right now. You, I'll, it'll be on the recording, but stay where you're at in 1 Samuel. All right, this is in Mark, and, and it's chapter 11. And it's really key to, it's key for us because we, ha, we haven't learned really how to govern our lives in Christ. So let me see. I'm going to read out of um, the Amplified. This is one of those, I got four at one, four and one. So it says, Jesus is speaking. Verse 22, uh, Mark chapter 11. And, uh, Jesus, and Jesus replying said to them, have faith in God constantly. Truly I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and thrown, what did he say? Whoever says to this mountain, be lifted up and be thrown into the sea and does not doubt at all in his heart, but believes that what he says will take place, it will be done for him. Now, either Jesus is a liar, and he's not, or we aren't using the truth that he's given us. Which is it? We will, we, it's easier for us to buy the negative because we've been trained by the world to buy the negative. We've been trained by generations to buy the negative instead of buying the positive from God. Worry is not a psychological problem. It's a theological problem. Amen. Worry, the origin of worry is in Genesis chapter 3, which goes right back to the sin we've talked about all along. Eve thought, I am all that, a bag of chips. Yeah, I want to be like God. Come on. Just have to eat that fruit, that's it. Yeah, I'm in. I'll bring the old man too. Listen. Whenever that happens, they, 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 rather than living under God's authority in paradise, they wanted to live and take on the status and responsibilities of God. And they asserted, inserted themselves as rulers of their own universe. And consequently, they learned the stress of trying to control time and destiny and morality. No human being is capable of exercising such control, yet we all try. We play God and find ourselves overwhelmed by the pressure. Worry is toxic to our souls. It blinds us to what God has done and blocks us from what He could do, all because we focus on ourselves rather than on God. Our craving for self-sufficiency disables trust, but it also does something else. We're supposed to look to God, the God of the, the present, the future, and the past. But rather than looking to God, when we're believing God for something big, we look back and we try to find, we look for things in our life that will give us a reason that God just might not work in this situation. Because we failed at this a thousand times before. Why would God succeed now? Interesting. Why not let God be God and you just be you? That seems to be an easier way to do things. It makes me angry. I, I, I get angry. Two things. I, this may be personal foibles of mine. Do not ever give me a job that you entrust to me and then tell me how to do the job you just entrusted to me. That will tick me off. And then the other is, tell me that I can't do something that God told me that I can do. Tell me that a promise that God gave to me isn't going to come to pass because of my shortcomings and my failings and my past. That's all under the blood, boys and girls. All of that. Amen. 
And because of that, I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. The word says to do exploits. And th- listen, don't kid yourself. This is a mega church. I don't care how many people are in the pews. This is a mega church. We have, we have and can have impact in our families, our community, our state, our nation, and the world from here. Amen. Souls will be saved. Lives will be changed because we're trusting him to do it. Listen, the, 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 here's the thing. We have to take every thought captive, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. When, when Satan accosts us with negative thoughts, we wrestle those to the ground and we expel them from our mind. The trick is you just can't get rid of the thought because that leaves a vacuum. And it's just going to suck that thought right back into your head. Think about that when somebody calls you empty-headed. All right. The trick is we have to replace the negative thought with God's truth. What is it that Abraham called the name of that place? Jehovah Jireh. God provides. And there are other places you'll see his name. Jehovah Rapha. God heals. And, and, I, and I get it, I, I, I get it when people, when people they, they kind of want to believe God, but they kind of know, you know, we've got all these doctors and nurses and medical science, and, and they've, got this, they've got this disease, and, and, and yeah, I, I, if it's God's will, I'll be healed. If it's God's will, it is God's will, be healed. If it's God's will that I prosper, it is God's will. Be prosperous. If I could only, if God could only make me happy, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The Lord is at hand. He's right there. Reach out for Him. Let Him come into the middle of your situation. The space and place that we give to our thoughts will grow roots into our brains. And whatever we fertilize most will win the battle for our brains. Joyce Meyer talks about the battlefield of the mind. It is. It is. We have to learn to replace that. We have to look into the net present reality of the complete salvation of God in Christ Jesus. Every need we have is met in Him. And yet, I got to tell you, I, I'm, I didn't get a hold of my daughter in time yesterday for her to pick up some stuff at the store, so I had to go to town and I pick up one of the few radio stations that you can pick up out here, which is um, Marfa, um, yeah, that place, <laughs> National People's Ra- Public Radio, um, and uh, and I'm listening to this lady, who's a scientist who gets paid, saying. Yes, I believe dogs can be racist. I went, hold on, wait a second. You're probably probably being paid by the government, right? Okay. (laughs) Only the government would hire scientists to determine whether or not dogs can be racist. (laughs) I'm astounded. Uh, Okay, I'm I'm off the rails a little bit. Let's go. Let's go to First Samuel, uh, please. I want I want to look at somebody else. And I want, to look, I want you to look at the consistency of how faith is applied. 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I guess I'm going to start in the second verse. It's important because it gives you a little background. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah did not. Each year, Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of Heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at that time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. On the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Penina and each of her children. And, and, though, he lo- and though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Penina would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. That's what the world always says. The world always blames it on God. 
why are you crying, Hannah? Okay, to ask, why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? Well, let's think back to what Social Security looked like back then, just from the practical standpoint. Not, not just a matter of, of whether this woman felt fulfilled in her life, but she was probably significantly younger than Elkanah. That was the practice at that time. And if you wanted to have Social Security, you better have some kids because they're the ones that are going to have to take care of you. So, after one sacrificial meeting at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her, seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound, he thought she'd been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Man, I'm telling you. I, I, I pastored a church that was a homeless shelter. I, I would love it if people would just come in. I didn't care if they were drunk. I wanted them to come in. But you know what? Religion will stand up there and judge you. That empty glove of religion will stand up there and judge you as if that empty glove has a closer relationship with the Lord than you. God wants a personal relationship with you, a daily dialogue, a conversation with you. Because he has some things to do in your heart and in your life, and he has some good things for you. I sent a, I sent a little uh, piece out this morning. I'm going to go right back in here to... Uh, I'm going to go right back here to 1 Samuel in just a second. But I want to share this. This is, uh, this is from Jeremiah. And, and I know it gets passed around a lot these days. And it's a popular scripture, but I saw it this morning. And it was one of the, on one of the devotionals I'm working on. And, and, it's, and it's this. For, for I, verse, verse 11, for I know, 29, 11, for I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you hope and a future, a positive final outcome, prosperity. Okay, I, 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 got, I had a chance to listen to somebody I used to listen to all the time, and I still think that there were a lot of valid things happening in his ministry. He was a major international healer. Uh, and and he and he came and, and he came out and he said I, I'm just going to renounce this prosperity gospel. Okay, I get that, but it's not the prosperity gospel that I have a problem with. It's the way it was preached and taught, and it's still preached and taught. You put your money in here, God's going to pour out. That's a line of crap. God may pour out, but don't you be putting that money in in order to him for him to give to you. Do it because God said it. He wants that to come from your heart, not from your wallet. And if you if and I I've done this a lot of times in, in before ministry and during ministry, I just I, I look at my wallet, whatever I've got in it, that goes in. And sometimes it's a big chunk and sometimes it's not a big chunk. But but for me and God, that's me saying, okay, everything I have. Everything I have is yours. What, why, what is the proper perspective on prosperity? Why did Jabez say, Lord, bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, let your hand be with me, keep me from evil, that I might not cause others, might, might not cause pain? Why did he pray that? Because he wanted, when he said, expand my territory, he wasn't just talking about his personal supply of wealth. It was his influence in the lives of others for the cause of God. And that's where we should be. When we're, when we're asking God to cause us to prosper, we're asking him to make us a conduit of his blessing into the lives of others. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something, and one I'm going to share openly, and the other one is private. Uh, but two needs. 
One is Gull. Gull has finally, after all these months and months of, of, of trying and, 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 and trying to support him from here, and he's in Thailand. He's now gotten the government and the lawyers involved to say, okay, we'll get you a visa. It's about 3,100 bucks. Tracy and I already thought, sold $3,100 into that. Three, I mean, sorry, $300 into that $3,100 need. We are believing that, man, that this coming week, that's going to be approved. And we're believing that somewhere, somehow, God's going to make that resource happen. I asked the Lord, I said, hey, if it can happen through me, make it happen through me. And, but I'd like to see that happen. Why? Well, I want to see gold blessed. But I know that when that testimony of God moving in his life, that now he can have a life and a job. Even though he's living in Thailand, he'll be able to have a paycheck. He'll be able to support his family. It's worthwhile. David, um, King David was, was on in the, on the ridge, ridge of the Valley of Elah talking to his brother uh, and saying, who is this loudmouth giant down here? And why, and why is he talking smack? And, and, his, and his brother said, shut up, kid, go. And David says, wait, wait, isn't there a cause? Isn't there a reason for me being upset? What, why aren't you down there doing something about that loudmouth giant blaspheming God? We have an opportunity. There are giants all around every day blaspheming God, and we have an opportunity to pick up a stone and put it in a sling and put the giant down. Why aren't we? Well, you have to have faith. So anyway, let's go back to Hannah. 2911 what? Jeremiah 2911. Okay. And there's another one you might look up. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> <coughs> I forgot I put that in there this morning. Um, that was my, that was my, I think, one of my few edits this morning. Oh, there was another edit. <laughs> what does love look like? Jesus. On your bulletin, do you look like Jesus? You know, you remember the you remember what the the little bracelets? What would Jesus do? That hasn't been that long ago, has it? Okay, we need to ask that question of ourselves regularly in every situation, in every relationship, in every circumstance. What would Jesus do? How would he re How can Jesus walk this out through me in this moment and make the most impact for the kingdom of God? That's the real question. So anyway, going back to Hannah again, she says, uh, she, she says, oh, oh no, sir, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I'm very discouraged and I was pouring my heart out to the Lord. Don't think I'm a wicked woman, for I've been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you've asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir. She exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. I, I'm, we're going to finish up that in just a second, but I, I want you to look at what happened. She got a word from God that settled it. She said, "I." She, and I understand when, when we're watching when we're watching the high priest that that, that speaks into the life of people that traditionally Israel saw that high priest as an oracle of God, okay? So he said, may God grant your request. What happened? She stopped being sad. She went and got something to eat. Why? Because she trusted God. That's why she went to him to begin with. <coughs> why would she do that? Because every year, her husband, Elkanah, made it a practice to go up. He spent some time. He spent some time every year to go up and worship the Lord and bring his sacrifice and make things right. This was momentous that she did what she did. Now look what happens. And the entire family got up the next morning. They went to worship the Lord once more. Then they returned to Ramah. Where Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked the Lord for him. 
Man, I, I, I got to tell you, we have this great opportunity to walk by faith. And every time we don't do that, we miss God. This is a, a word that I read from a prophet this morning. This was actually on the seventh yesterday's message. I am, this is the Lord speaking through the prophet. And understand that the, 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 the God gave some apostles, some prophets, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists for the equipping of the saints. So this is a person who has a prophetic anointing. All right, so he's speaking truth. What is prophecy? Prophecy is truth. Could be past truth, present truth, future truth. But if you study prophecy in the Bible, you'll see that it telescopes out. That truth is consistent all the way through. This is the word. I am, this is the word speaking. I am poised and ready to pour out my glory on the earth. I search for people who will believe my word, speak my word, and act on my word. I anointed my son with all authority, then passed that authority on to you, my children. I take great pleasure in acting on your situations and circumstances when you execute my power within you. Exercise my authority over everything by the confession of your words. Stop allowing the dark daggers into your life. The dark daggers of fear and worry and doubt. And do not engage in unbelief. Either, either the Lord is God or He's not. You need to make that decision and stand on that decision. That's what Abram did. That's what Hannah did. They stood on the goodness of God. I have no, I have no respect. I, there are some people who have chosen a certain lifestyle who, who live here in the DMR who I invited. I invite them regularly to come to church. Why? Because it's not my position to judge them. I, I, I disagree with what they're doing and I, and, I, and I agree with what the Word says that it's sin. However, they call themselves Christians. They need fellowship with other believers. They're not going to grow without that fellowship. They're not going to grow without this connection to God. They've, they've found their own glove and they've gotten very comfortable with it. It's us two and no more. Us four and no more. We're, we're, we're not going to involve anybody else because they might think differently than us. And we're in this place where, where we, have, we no longer have the freedom to disagree and have a civil discourse with one another. Instead, we have to demonize and we have to throw rocks and we have to fire off bombs and we have to shoot people in malls. It's got to stop. And where does it stop? It stops with each of us right here. Each one of us. Matthew 8.26, he said to them, Why are you afraid, you men of little faith? And he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm. We need to Believe God. I've said this before, you know, it's easier for us to believe in God than it is for us to believe Him. We need to take that first step and we need to trust in the Lord. We need, we need to receive and accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. We need to, we need to, we need to allow that, that anointing of the Holy Spirit to come in our lives and, and to empower us so that we're thinking the thoughts that God would have us to think, speaking the words God would have us to speak, and carrying out the actions that God would have us to carry out. How do we do that? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You can't do it. You fall into the same trap that Eve fell in. You, you fall into the same, that, that same trap of letting worry and fear dominate your brain. When God created you to operate on faith, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Every one of you in here who have accepted Jesus Christ, you have believed God, and he's accounted that to you as righteousness. And if for some reason you haven't, why? And if for some reason you've walked away from that fellowship and you found other priorities that have just distanced you from Him. Why are you allowing that distance 
He said, if you would draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. Bring him into your life. Bring him into your marriage. Bring him into your family. Bring him into your community. Bring him into this personal situation you might be facing right now. We are on the brink. I, I, I don't know if you, you, you heard what he, this prophet was saying. He said, I am poised and ready to pour out my glory on the earth. I search for people who will believe my word, speak my word, and act on my word. You know, we've, we've been in this scripture many times, John chapter 14. Jesus said, the works that I do, you will do also, and greater works than these you'll do because I go to my Father. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it, that the Father be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. What are the commandments he's talking about? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus perfects it and says, love one another as I have loved you. That's what we're called to. And that's why it's not important for me to beat somebody down about the sin that's in their life. They already know. It's no surprise to them. What, what happens is they just don't want the light to come in because then they have to admit it to themselves. But if, if we will do that, if we'll let his light come in, then we become a beacon of that light. Don't you think the world's dark enough? Why contribute to the darkness when God has called you to walk in his marvelous light and to be a beacon of his light and his love to this entire world? You know, I, having spent some time in so many different denominations, I remember this uh, Baptist, independent fundamental Baptist, independent fundamental white shirt, skinny black tie, short hair Baptist church, because those were the rules. Okay, he said, he said this, he said, the only thing you can take with you are the people that you've shared Jesus with. That's the only stuff you get. Yeah, and I, I think we'll get to have our puppies and our dogs. I mean, there are animals in heaven. I've read the Bible. You know, there are animals where the Lord is. So Char Charlotte gets to be with us, and Rock can tell us which of those owls got him. You know. <laughs> Charlotte heard me, huh? I said her name, okay. I, I, want, I want to tell you that um, as we go through this, and again, I, I want to encourage you, this, this study that I'm doing on faith right now, this devotional, tag into it if you can, uh, and, and let the Lord speak to you. This, these two selections of Scripture that I just shared with you, the thing I like about this particular devotional is that's what it gives you. It doesn't give you commentary. It just gives you the Scriptures. And as you look at the scripture, if you'll take the time to see what's being said, you'll see how our faith drives our thoughts, our thoughts form our words, and our words create our future. You know, when... When Jesus was at the pool of Bethesda, there was this guy who'd been there for 38 years. And, and, and he would get people to like bring him there and he would wait for the next moment when the, their belief was that it, when the angel troubled the water, if they could be the first one in, they would be healed. And, and have you ever seen somebody that just... They're in the same rut that they've been in for decades and decades and decades. Okay. Well, Jesus walks up to the guy who's been laying there for 38 years, and this was his word to him. Do you want to be healed? I want to tell you, there are so many people who are so comfortable in their chaos. They're so comfortable in their disease. They're, they're comfortable in their circumstances because they don't want to challenge their heart to believe for anything more. Why? Have you ever looked around us? Do you think any human being created 
this place that we live in. God did this. And, and for those of you who may be intellectuals, I'll be happy to debate you and match you <laughs> argument for argument. God did not make me the, the dullest knife in the drawer. And I can, I, can handle, I can handle your questions. I say that with all humility. You know? And, and I, I want to tell you, it's, I, I have been, <laughs> I've been doing some, this, I've been doing math in my head for a while. And so people will like rattle numbers off and I'm already, I'm already manipulating them in my brain and determining what, those, what that total is for those numbers. And it's because God, I have the mind of Christ. You know, if you realize that you have the mind of Christ, what is there that can't be known to you? What is there that you can't undertake? If you have Christ in you, what is impossible to you? Nothing. Everything is possible. If you believe. If you believe. You know, I, I, I want to go back to Abraham. We're going to finish up with him here in just a second. Um, I... I admire the fact that Abraham left everything that was comfortable and familiar with him. And he went off to a place that God told him to go. I, I, I can't remember the first time I read that story about, about Abraham and Isaac, but I, I can imagine there was a little trepidation. I, I mean, that's a pretty, pretty graphic story where God tells this hero of the faith to go offer his son as a sacrifice, a burnt offering. And, and you know, that's what the pagans did at that time. There were worshipers of, I believe it was Moloch in that area. And, and they would put their kids in a big pit of coals and burn them up so they could get rain or better crops. And, and God tested Abraham taking him down a path that Abraham should have resisted. But he didn't. I told Robert, we were talking this morning, I said, you know, I believe if it had gone any further and Abraham had started to plunge that knife down, God would have put his hand in. Or God would have just said to Isaac, that knife wound doesn't mean anything. Get up, boy. You're whole. You're healed. We have to have that kind of absolute trust. And, and I'm not talking about a blind faith. If you, if you need reasons to believe God, open this word that I just read to you. What about what happened with Abraham? What about what happened with Hannah? Do you think your life is insignificant? I guarantee you it's not. It's significant to God. God poured out His Spirit for you. He allowed His Son to die on the cross for you. He allowed you to be empowered for his glory and for your blessing. So choose. You know, we talked about we talked about Elijah and the prophets of Baal a couple weeks ago. And, and, and there are the prophets of Baal that cut themselves. They've been shouting and singing and screaming all day long. And they're exhausted and, and no fire comes from heaven. And Elijah goes, thank you, Lord. And fire consumes the sacrifice. And the dries up the water and everything's gone. When we, and, and, then, and then, you know, but the, the message before that, before that whole thing happened between Elijah and the prophets of Baal was, you know, if, if God's God, then follow him. If Baal's God, then follow him. If you need some proof in your God, life and you need God to give you some absolute proof and you're not sure whether God's going to work in your situation, put him to the test. The Bible tells you to do that. Don't sit there and worry and fret and doubt. Get up off of your unbelief and trust the Lord. Why don't we do that? Because we have been conditioned for mediocrity and failure. That's what our society does for us. When Eve decided that she wanted to, ha she wanted to have the knowledge of good and evil and be like God, she accepted the path to mediocrity and defeat. You don't have to do that. It's your choice. 
And, 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 that's, and, and that was what was being said on the mountain. Choose today. Is it God or is it Baal? God demonstrated himself. He'll demonstrate himself in your situation. I, I will tell you, I was thinking this morning, you know, we've, we can look at as long a string or strand of time as you want in your life, from birth, let's say, to death. And once you become consciously aware, once you become consciously aware, your life is a series of decisions until you die. Choose well. Choose God. Choose faith. That's what's important. Choose Jesus. Let's pray. Ruth, if you would come. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us today. Your word, your grace, your mercy, your peace. Thank you for faith. Lord, as I was looking at the bulletin this morning, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance, the evidence. What we, what we look for, Lord, is a reason to hope. And we, and we know in our hearts that our, our hope will take us to the path of faith. And faith will take us to victory. The enemy knows that too. And that's why hope in our hearts, hope in the heart of an unbeliever is rebellion against the enemy. Because that hope will eventually lead us to you. Lord, take our hearts Make them completely yours. Just like you keep your head bowed and your eyes closed for just a moment. And I'm going to look around and if there's anybody in here where the Lord just has, there's something on your heart, something you need prayer for, you want to pray for somebody else, you just let you know. We're going to be praying downstairs as we get ready to have prayer. Father, you see those whose hearts and hands are lifted before you. Just, they've just invited you to dive into the middle of their situation. I'm asking that you do that. That you give them the victory that they seek. And that you bring glory to your name. Lord, make us a people who have a heart for you. Make us a people who are not cowed by worry or fear. By our courage, by faith, we believe the very best of you and the very best of your plans for us. But we love you, we praise you, we worship you, we thank you that the most important theology that we can ever hear is what's being played on the piano of you. Jesus loves me in this song of the the Bible tells me so. Little ones to hit me on. continue the service in, in that fellowship and prayer. Continue to be with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, let's do our last song.
It's in your bulletin. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. Earth life is worth the living just because he lives.